Zechariah 9, verse 9, reads this way. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Matthew 21, beginning at verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? The crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Amen. You may be seated. I want to share today from the idea, the Messiah returns. The Messiah returns. Thank you, ushers. The Messiah returns. Um, how many of y'all like movies? Y'all watch movies? Now y'all lying, right? Like... <laughs> Like, nobody's, everybody's like, I don't know, what's a movie? Like, yeah, I know y'all watch them. Amen. So, yeah, I watch movies too. And maybe one of the, the best movies that I've seen uh, is, an, is an older one called The Gladiator. Did y'all see The Gladiator? Yes, I thought it was excellent. It was a, I, yeah, thumbs up. It was a great movie. Even Rotten Tomatoes liked it. Um... Well, if you think back to the gladiator, for those of you who saw it, and maybe even for those who didn't, there's a scene in the movie where the emperor, Commodus, is riding into the city of Rome. He is on a chariot, and all of the royal entourage is dressed in uh, their royal regalia. They've got royal purple and white. Um, everybody is in their proper positions. That certain times as they're showing this scene, there are flower petals that are falling from above. Um, the, uh, the streets are packed with people, but they've all been cordoned off in their appropriate sections. Uh, in in uh, Roman tradition, everything's in very tight rows and columns and squares. It's quite the scene. But the people had this exuberance, right? There was a lot of energy in the city. People who hated Commodus and people who loved him were all excited and shouting, because the king had returned. The king was coming back into the city. Here in our text, we see the same type of energy. We see a similar type of celebration, but for quite a different reason. It wasn't the king of Rome who was coming into the city. It was Jesus. And the Bible tells us that as Jesus <coughs> approached Jerusalem... He came in riding on the back of a foal of a donkey, a baby donkey, if you will. 
The excitement in the city and leading up to Jerusalem was very high. It, it was so high that people began to, to take off their outer garments, their cloaks, and began to lay them in the road so that this donkey carrying Jesus could walk on them. Some were beginning to cut down branches of, of trees in the area and lay them down in the streets, almost like an ancient red carpet for this man who was coming into the city. And, and out of their excitement and their exuberance, they were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But what were they really shouting about? Did they even really understand what was happening? Was, was, was this really a, a moment of triumph? And victory that was worthy of praise? Or was this the prelude to perhaps the greatest tragedy the world has ever seen? That's a question that we have to deal with today. And as we, we do this, in order to help us work through this and understand this, we do need to grapple with some of the background as it related to the messianic expectation that the people of Israel had. See, from the time that Israel became a people, it was always God's intention that he would be their king. That he would be their ruler, that he would be everything that the people needed, but yet they refused him. You may recall from your prior reading and prior study that, that, that the people of Israel longed to have a human king just like all of the nations around them. They, they weren't content with being the people that God had chosen and the people that, that he was going to rule and govern. They wanted to be just like everybody else. And that's still a temptation for the people of God. We, we want to be in the kingdom. We want to be right with the Lord, but we also want to look like everybody else. We, we want to dress like everybody else, and we want to act like everybody else, and we want to talk like everybody else, and be in the spaces that everybody else is in, even though God is calling his people to be peculiar. The people wanted to be like the nations all around them. And so God presented Saul and the people chose him because he was tall and handsome. Later, David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, became king. And it was during his reign, the reign of King David, that Israel began to experience a portion of what peace was would look like and what shalom was like when God was being sincerely worshipped, when they had a God-centered and God-focused leader. Ultimately, though, a spirit of rebellion crept into the Israelite community and, and the Israelites, the Jews, began to worship and to idolize false gods from the surrounding nations. They, they began to incorporate into their daily activity things that they didn't think were so dangerous. They didn't think that there was any real risk by grappling with the bells because they too needed their crops to grow. And, and so they would flirt with the bells, these other Canaanite gods, in order that they would be blessed. But we still have Yahweh on our side also. This, this move towards incorporating paganism and what theologically is called syncretism, where you're kind of mixing some stuff together and you come up with something new, it started with King Solomon. He's known as the wisest man to ever live, but yet he allowed the, the, uh, uh, the building up of these pagan worship sites, having been influenced by the, his wives and his concubines to give a place, an equal spot for their gods to be worshipped as well. And before long, guess what happened? The people began to follow suit. Their leader had already opened the door and the people began to walk through it. So they began to worship uh, uh, these false gods and practice things that our Lord Yahweh found to be detestable. So to, to challenge, to, to discipline rather, his people, God sent foreign nations to conquer them and divide them. 
After subjection to Egypt and Assyria and Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and now Rome, the Jews began to hold dear this, these prophecies that spoke of one who would come and make all things right. We refer to these prophecies as being messianic prophecies. And these prophecies specifically spoke of a ruler, one who was more like David and from the Davidic lineage, who would return to Jerusalem, defeat the foreign occupier, and then assume the throne as king. He would be the one that would bring peace to the land and would uh, evict all of the spiritual oppression that had been placed upon the people by the enemy. We read Zechariah 9, verse 9, and, and there it spoke of a king who would return riding on the foal of a donkey. Zechariah said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The people had a messianic expectation. But what kind of Messiah were they expecting? What kind of king, what kind of ruler did they really anticipate coming into the city? When the people saw that this Jesus was riding on the back of a donkey and, and they remembered all of the miraculous things that he had done, all of the great works, the feeding of the, the 5,000 and, and feeding up the 4,000 and healing all types of people. They looked at Jesus and they shouted, Hosanna. They shouted, here comes the king. Blesses he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they took off their Versace and they took off their Louis Vuitton and they took off their Tarjay and they laid it right in the walkway. Hallelujah. Because they saw him as someone special. They had an expectation of a Messiah who would meet certain criteria. So, 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 so all of this stuff was reminiscent of the things that they had studied in, in uh, Jewish school, if you will. But apparently, they had some misunderstandings. And while they had a messianic expectation, the, did they, were they expecting the right things? And it kind of begs the question, when we come to Christ, what, what kind of Messiah do we expect to worship? Are we, we, we come in to worship a God of our own creation, a God that is always okay with our lifestyle, a God that, that will do uh, the things that we think he ought to do and stay away from the kinds of things that we don't want him to be bothered with. What exactly did you think that that was going to happen when you came to worship the Lord? I suspect that much like the Jews, that, that some of us who come to Christ, we too have uh, an expectation, but we have a misunderstanding. We need to get clear about it. And, and I think it's true here that there was a messianic misunderstanding. Look in Matthew chapter 21, verse 8 and 9. It says this, most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They were lifting up their voices with praise and adulation. But notice how they used the word Hosanna. You would think it was a synonym for hallelujah. Hallelujah means praise the Lord, but that's not what Hosanna means. See, over time, Hosanna became used as a term of praise. It was a word that began to be incorporated in the praise liturgies of the religious community in Israel. Right? So, 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 so you would find some praise songs and they would call them hosannas with a plural. Right? But here's the thing. Hosanna doesn't mean praise. The word actually is a cry of prayer that means save us, we pray. 
And so isn't it kind of interesting that you can be so close to asking God for what you really need and still miss it? You, you, you ever heard people uh, use words out of context that lets you know they don't even know what it means? Oh, you just heard somebody say that. This seemed like the right time to use it, and so you just kind of threw it out there. But you're like, no, that ain't it, bro. I understand it sounds good, but that ain't what you meant. And that happens in church life, too. You hear somebody say, praise the Lord, or thank you, Jesus, and it sounds like the right place, but you really may not understand the full import of what it is that you're saying. And these people have begun to appropriate a prayer and use it as a praise. And then that's a challenge for us all, that we need to be careful that we don't find ourselves just doing stuff that feels churchy, but we don't even understand what we're saying, and we don't understand why we're saying it, but it sounds so good, and it makes us feel like we fit into the group. But we loud and wrong. We out of order. It's interesting. That the thing that the people really needed the most, they were saying in the word Hosanna, but they were using it for a completely different purpose. That's true for many of us. Many of us want to, it seems like we're so eager to be involved with praising God that we never get around to the point of asking God for what we really need. We want to feel something, and we want to shout it, and we want to dance, but we don't ever get to the business of asking God to save us or asking God to help us reconcile with our enemies or asking God to help us be a good steward over the time that we have on this planet or asking God to help us keep our mouth shut when we want to talk or help us to tell the truth when a lie got us in a chokehold, right? It's so odd that we can be so close. We can be so close. And still miss it. That's true. That's true of me, I know. We can be so close to God and using all the right language and never get to the point of asking him for what we need. What were they really asking for salvation for? They, they, they thought it was a praise, but they were praying, Lord, save us, we pray. What were they wanting to be saved from? It should have been a prayer asking that they would be saved and spared from the consequences of their sin. But what they were really clamoring for was for salvation from Rome. They wanted to be saved from Rome. They wanted to get rid of the occupier. And the messianic expectation that they had is that this Messiah would come and they thought Jesus might come into Jerusalem and kick Rome out forever. See, they didn't understand the imagery of Jesus riding in town on the back of a baby donkey. Somewhere along the line, they might have had the gladiator in mind. Right, that this was, this was the king coming in town and victorious after having conquering and he was going to assume his throne in power and glory. But Jesus came in on a donkey. He was not coming as a conquering warrior, but instead he was coming in peace and humility. And if we're honest, y'all, we don't like that Jesus. We want the Jesus that's coming with a knife and a shotgun. Right, we want the Jesus that put people in check. We want Jesus that tighten everybody up, get everything lined up and in order. But Jesus was not coming to do that kind of business. He was coming in peace and humility. See, they didn't fully understand Zechariah when he indicated that the basis of their shout, the basis of their rejoicing was that their Messiah was coming in spiritual righteousness. That he wasn't just a god of the, uh, a king of the times, a ruler of the times. He was holy and righteous. That he was going to judge rightly and he was going to treat everybody in the way that they ought to be treated and he was going to view people rightly. He was coming in righteousness. And he was coming with spiritual salvation in his hand. They wanted geopolitical salvation, but he was coming with a salvation that would last for a lifetime. It will last for an eternity. There was a messianic misunderstanding. 
They were looking for the Messiah, but they didn't really understand who was supposed to be coming. They wanted this Messiah to do this one thing, kick out Rome, but the Messiah was actually committed to doing something else. And unfortunately, like many of us, they missed their real spiritual need because all they could see is their social need. They missed their real spiritual need because all they could see was their social and their physical needs. They didn't fully grasp the significance of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And is that not like many of us today? You got to be careful. Don't find yourself being the one saying, when I was living there, I know it was Jesus. No, you wouldn't. You'd be, just like, you'd be just like everybody else in the crowd. Because watch this. How many of us have neglected our spiritual needs in favor of meeting our physical needs? How many of us have chosen to work overtime on Wednesday? You could have done it on Thursday or Tuesday, but you decided to work overtime on Wednesday so you don't have to go to Bible study. How many of us have postponed some of our spiritual goals in order to accomplish our physical ones? In order to achieve our, our career aspirations, we've decided to put God on the back burner. You got God on Simmer right now. He's back on the little eye. You can't do nothing on that little eye. You ain't even got a pot small enough to take advantage of it. But do you have God on the Simmer eye of your, your life? You got him on the back burner. Oh, no, 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 no. You there, Jesus. You there. You in my life. I just got these other things that I'm trying to do. Let me put, put God on hold in order to pursue the physical and social priorities that we have. And because the Israelites, the Jews were doing this, the Bible tells us that Jesus wept over Jerusalem because they did not recognize when God had come to them. He wasn't here in theory. He wasn't just here in word. He was here in the flesh, had ridden right into the city, and the people didn't even recognize him. They continued to miss God even when he came in the flesh. Would you know God if he came in here today? If he rode in here on a donkey, would you know him? Would you know him? Maybe the question is, would he know you? Y'all, let's just be honest. We got to stay humble because some of us are just like the Jews. Be careful. Be careful how we compare ourselves to the people of old because there's nothing new. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every last one of us. Some of us are just like the Jews. We've got spiritual palm branches and we lay our spiritual cloaks on the ground, but we sing songs that we don't fully understand. We don't know what the words mean, but because it sounds good and we like it, we just sing it. Or we use words because they sound churchy and it makes us feel like we're part of the clique. But we're using them out of order. We don't understand the significance and therefore we can't really receive the blessing. Because we sound churchy but we're not churchy. Perhaps even worse, what we have is that we have a half understanding of the truth. And then we run with that and... The reality is having half of the truth ends up putting us in worse bondage than having no truth at all. A lot of folks are calling stuff uh, uh, church hurt, but what it is is poor discipleship. Like, like if you were reading your Bible, you would have known that was a lie when they said it. If you had spent time studying and praying, you would have had the discernment to know that that was out of order to begin with. That you shouldn't have been trusting that man anyway. And let me tell you, as much as I love Jesus, you can't take everything I say to the bank. Because sometimes I say Peter when I met Paul. Sometimes I misspeak because I get so excited and my tongue is tied up. But if you go back to the text, you'll know exactly what it is that God has told you and what it it is that he expects of you. But some of it is just bad discipleship. It ain't that the people hurt you. It's that you were so ignorant that you didn't recognize the, the danger when it was right in front of you. That's just the truth, y'all. That's just the truth. It's some mean folk in church, though. Amen. <laughs> That's a discipleship problem, too. <laughs> 
Well, some of it would be averted if you just read your Bible. Just read your Bible. Sometimes we get so affixed on our physical needs and our desires that we totally neglect our spiritual needs and we end up glomming on to these half understandings that put us in deeper bondage. We run with this stuff and we'll be loud and wrong. Right? For example, like John 12, 16 says that the disciples didn't even understand the triumphal entry until after Jesus was glorified. Now he didn't laugh. They was like, oh, 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 hey, Peter, I got it. He gone. These are the people that were with him three years, who walked in Jerusalem with him, who was picking around trees, watching him get crucified. And they didn't get him until he was after he was glorified. Watch this. Folks in the crowd got it wrong, too. Look at what it says. It says, verse 10, and he entered Jerusalem. The whole city was stirred up. Who is this? The crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus. Now watch this. These, these folks that shouted Hosanna to the son of David. That means they understand him to be the king. Jesus, the king. They're thinking about Zechariah 9, that, that the Messiah is going to come in on a donkey. They witness all of these miracles, and trust me, people ain't showing up at no parade just because they ain't got nothing to do. They remember the fish sandwiches that was passed out. They remember how somebody, Auntie, got healed. They remember Lazarus walking around in the city out of the tomb, right? So they ain't just there because they ain't got nothing to do on, on uh, the Sunday before the Passover. They out there because he was working miracles. They calling him the son of David. They shouting, Hosanna, save us. They witness all the miracles that can't nobody do but God. But when the climax reaches and they have the opportunity to give testimony on who Jesus is, what comes out of their mouth is this is Jesus the prophet. How you miss that? That's even contradicting the things that are coming out of your mouth. You're calling him the son of David, which means he is of royal lineage, that he is the king, but you're calling him a prophet. He's doing stuff that can't nobody do but God, but yet you're calling him a prophet. They totally missed it. And we don't want to be the kind of people that will come into church and call Jesus a prophet or call him just a good teacher or call him a moral person who's living a good life. He is greater than the Lord. He is greater than a prophet. He is greater than the angels. He is greater than Moses. He is greater than Jacob. He is God in the flesh. Hallelujah. He is Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, Messiah. He is the one who will soon return. He is the Lord. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. He is the Lord. Don't you find yourself coming to church all the time and calling Jesus a good teacher. <laughs> Lord, help us. They missed it. They missed it. And that's why you can't trust the crowd. You can't trust the crowd. You got to make a decision about Jesus on your own. You can't trust the crowd. Because the crowd will be loud and wrong and you'll find yourself following through with groupthink. Voting like they vote just because they vote in that way. You better think for yourself because you're going to bear them consequences by yourself. If you're wrong, it's going to be you. Ain't going to be, well, we going to be, ain't no we, it's you. You. Right? Having a half understanding or an incomplete understanding, right, is dangerous. And it reminds us that we got to stay humble. We got to stay humble. Me, you, we, we have to stay humble and stay close to Jesus. We got to stay close to Jesus and engage in his word. And because God has fulfilled every messianic expectation, he has clarified every messianic misunderstanding by showing that Jesus the Christ is the messianic fulfillment. He is the messianic fulfillment. Look at verse 4 and then we out of here. It says, this took place 
to fulfill what was spoken. All of this stuff that Jesus was doing was to fulfill what was spoken. There's not one thing that happens by chance. You're not even here today by chance. It was by divine appointment. There's nothing that happens by chance. All of these things happen by design. They were intentional because God was accomplishing something. And Jesus, as the messianic fulfillment, came to earth to defeat Satan, to defeat death, and to defeat hell. Hallelujah. He rode into Jerusalem to give his life as a humble sacrifice through his death on the cross. That was the purpose of him doing what he was doing, and his timing was impeccable. It was immaculate. It was impeccable. As people were gathering into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, most of us remember the Passover. It's the account when the death angel would pass over those homes who had the blood of a perfect lamb smeared or anointed over the doorposts and the lentils. Now, I don't have time to kind of unpack that, but let me just tell you what I learned this week about the Passover. The root of the word for Passover is Pesach, right, which has an Egyptian connection. When you look at the translation of this word that that becomes Passover, the imagery is not the idea of skipping over something. It is the imagery of someone extending their wings in order to offer protection. Hallelujah. So those houses that had the blood of the lamb smeared over their doorposts and lentils, it wasn't that the death angel was passing over or skipping over their house. It's that God himself, hallelujah, had extended his arms of protection and shielded them from the destroyer that was on their way, on his way to kill them. So God was literally protecting every house that had the blood covering over. He was passing over and it looked like he was just skipping over. But God was actively involved, taking care of and protecting and watching over his people who had the shed blood, hallelujah, of the Lamb of God that was slain. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And we see that Jesus, that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He takes away the sin of the world. And even if you don't even know, you should be saying hallelujah instead of hosanna. He worthy anyway. Hosanna and hallelujah in the highest to our God. Amen. Woo! Hallelujah. Now you may be wondering about that question I asked earlier. Is this a tragedy or is this a triumph? I say it's both. It's a tragedy for Satan. Because through the ministry of Christ, Satan lost his claim on us. It's a tragedy to sin. Because of Jesus, sin has lost its hold on us. Stuff don't hold you like it used to. Even because of Jesus, self has lost. Because it had to yield its priority over to Jesus Christ. So it was definitely a tragedy for some. But it was also a triumph. Because by Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross, Jesus whooped Satan. And he beat death. It was through his resurrection that Jesus perfected his claim to the throne of David. That he really is the son of David and the rightful ruler of Israel. It was through his resurrection that he confirmed his claim to be the son of God. If he had died on the cross and stayed in the tomb, we'd still be having questions. But on the third day, God answered all the questions. And everything he said about himself and I said about my son is true. That he is the only begotten son of God. Yes, and because of his death, burial, and resurrection, we triumph because he has made salvation not only free, but for all eternity, for everyone who would believe in him. All of this is the messianic fulfillment that God had you in mind when he sent Jesus through 42 generations, when he sent Jesus as his only begotten son to bear in his body the penalty that was due to us because of our sin. Oh, Zechariah said, oh, he's coming in righteous and salvation is in his hands. 
And I'm telling you, salvation is still available through the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Is there one here today? You're ready to make the decision. Ready to give your life today. Today is a great day to be saved. Zechariah said that he came in humility. But John the Revelator said he's coming on a white horse. He says the heavens will open up and he saw one who had a name that nobody else would name. But he's called faithful and true. Is there anybody here that knows Jesus to be faithful? That you can take his words to the bank. That you can count on him. That you can depend on him. That he won't leave you. Do you know Jesus to be true? Has he ever told you a lie? The Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie. He's a true God. He's a worthy God. John says he's not going to come by himself. There are going to be folks clothed in white linen. Riding on white horses. These are not animals of burden but these are animals of war he's coming for battle right now he's extending an opportunity to be a part of his family will you say yes to Jesus today the son of God Mary's baby the Messiah the soon coming king one day the king is going to return and it's not going to be like Commodus in the gla in Gladiator. When Jesus returns, all things will be made right. Sin will be no more. But you got to make a decision. You got to decide for yourself that you're going to worship the true God or the God that you've created yourself. What's it going to be? Because one of them is wrong. Why spend eternity apart from God when heaven is free? Will you come to Jesus?